you've decided to make singing your vocation, now what? You may be struggling to balance your life and a career in music. Are you curious about how other singers make it or how they've dealt with success and failure? Do you wonder what their biggest challenges have been or how about what they've learned on their journey and what's important to them today? Hi, I'm Valerie Day, a singer, educator, and creative explorer. You might know me from my work with the Grammy-nominated band New Shoes. Welcome to Living a Vocal Life, where I interview singers who have succeeded in creating a life in music. You'll hear from vocalists of all genres in different stages of their careers, including singers who've been on the Billboard charts and those who are teaching the next generation. What do they have in common? They're all performers with amazing stories to tell and experiences to share. In our conversations, you'll learn what inspired them to become a singer, the kinds of challenges they've encountered, and how they've overcome them. I'll also share what I've learned on my own journey as a singer and educator, practical tools and insights that will help you to live your best, most authentic vocal life. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Living a Vocal Life. Today's guest on the podcast is singer-saxophonist Rindy Ross from the band Quarter Flash. I first met Rindy in the early 80s when she and her husband Marv were riding the wave of their crossover hit, Harden My Heart. After years of playing bars in the Pacific Northwest as Seafood Mama, they had recently been signed to Geffen Records, changing their name to Quarter Flash. During their time with Geffen, they had four songs that charted on the top 40, and their self-titled debut album went platinum. They toured with Elton John, Linda Ronstadt, Sammy Hagar, Loverboy, The Beach Boys, Three Dog Night, Jefferson Starship, and more. In 1991, Rindy and Marv started the Trail Band, a blend of Americana, Celtic, Folklorico, and early music. They recorded a total of 13 albums and performed across the U.S. and Japan. In Portland alone, the Trail Band's holiday show has sold out over 100 times and raised more than a million dollars for the nonprofit Friends of the Children. Quarter Flash continued to perform and record two during this time, releasing two more albums on their own label. In addition to all the creative projects she's been a part of, Rindy has worked as a teacher and counselor. She's my go-to buddy when I need someone who is thoughtful and wise to talk about the craziness of the music business and the big stuff of life, too. She's a survivor in more ways than one. I love how she's navigated life's ups and downs with integrity, wholeheartedness, and an awesome sense of humor. Thanks for joining me on the show today, Rindy. I am delighted to be here. Thank you so much for having me. What's your first memory of singing? Ah, I think my very first memory of singing um, and singing in front of people, which is not exactly what you asked, but when I was in third grade, I would wrangle my friend Marna and make her do show and tell with me in front of the class. And show and tell really was um, an excuse to sing a song in front of the class. And so I remember we pretended to have a boat and we sang on Moonlight Bay <laughs> uh, in front of the class. And I just thought that was the best thing ever and did this little harmony thing. And Oh, that's um, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Moonlight Bay. Moonlight Bay. We were sailing along. And she, then she goes, we were sailing along. You know, anyway, <laughs> the message. And of course, I was bossy. No, you have to do this. You, and then you'll do this. And then I'll sing this. <laughs> you were producing already. Yes. <laughs> I love Poor it. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so let's fast forward a little bit. Did you know you wanted to be a singer? I knew that I loved to sing. And in a way, that's different than being a singer uh, as far as uh, professionally, because I always thought that I was going to be a teacher, either a high school teacher or I ended up doing elementary school. But I always thought that music might play a part in that, but I did not want to be a music teacher. I loved singing and mostly uh, for me, the high was harmony of mm. being a, being in a choir or harmonizing with one other person. So uh, yeah, and to this day, I think I would have been happy as a clown being a backup singer. Yeah, because of that 
that piece right there. Because mm-hmm. I think more than anything, I felt that my gift was that I heard harmony. And blend. And blend, yeah. Yeah. But harmony, I agree with you. I grew up singing with my brother and sister on family trips in the car and my mom and my dad. And I just love singing the alto part. You know, mm. my mom would always be on melody. And there's just something really special, especially in, in a choir, a large group of people, when the harmonics rub up against each other just the right way. I could just go for that forever. Forget lead singing. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, I loved that. And my, my sister and I um, would do the dishes and sing together. And I would always make her do the melody because I wanted to make up a harmony part. That's so cool. (laughs) So you got your teaching degree in the 70s and then taught for three years in Central Oregon while gigging in bands. Um, Yes. Tell me more about the time period in your life and what was it maybe that drew you to teaching and why did you decide to quit after three years and go full time into performing? I think that the draw to teaching was... um, Partly that from a young age, I felt compelled to be a helper, I guess, a person that could make a difference in someone else's life. Because I had had some very influential teachers, people that really changed my life. I think I wanted to have that experience myself. And so my direction through high school and through college was I was going to teach. And so when I graduated from college, it was at a time actually when it was um, hard to find teaching jobs because there was kind of a glut of teachers for some reason. And so I had my first interview at Western Oregon uh, University, which is where I went to school, and they gave me the job. (laughs) So I was married at that point already, and so it meant that Marv had to find a job somewhere near Redmond, Oregon. (laughs) His degree was also in education. So we did that, and we knew that we did want to play music. So we put together a band in Central Oregon that was called Jones Road, and it was because we lived on Jones Road. Perfect. Yep. And we played at various places, bars on weekends, and occasionally a Sunday night, which meant that I rolled into school on Monday morning. Oh, yeah. A little bit tired. You know, when you're um, 20 something, you have a ton of energy and Mm -hmm. it just was this great balance. I was teaching and enjoying my fifth grade class and um, having this great fun playing covers. And Marv was already doing original material that early. And so we would tuck in, you know, some of his original songs. And so it was just this very fun balance. Teaching is a wonderful profession. And it is a helping profession, and teachers change lives. I wish they were more revered in our culture. Oh, boy, do I, yeah. Um, It's an important job. Anyway, so you're in Central Oregon. You're teaching. Who are your influences musically at this time? You know, from about my last couple years of college and through my three years of teaching, I would say the strongest influence was Joni Mitchell mm-hmm. uh, because of her amazing voice, her her songwriting, which is, you know, incomparable. She was mesmerizing to me to watch her confidence on mm. the stage as she sat there with her, you know, lap dulcimer or her guitar or the piano. She just exuded this, I'm going to tell you a story and and you're going to listen. And of course you did. So she was the biggest influence, but certainly Bob Dylan and, you know, later on people like um, John Prine, uh, singer-songwriters. And I know that Marv's interest and ability to write songs really uh, influenced me too, as far as who we listened to together. So I think it was mostly singer-songwriters. Mm-hmm. Well, you guys together in Seafood Mama and in Quarter Flash, the songs are storyteller songs. They are. They're wonderful. And I love I love listening to them because of that. So you're in this band together and you're both teaching. And then what happens? 
Well, at that point, Marv was getting itchy to do music full time. I was not as confident as he that we could pull that off. So we had only taught for three years and he said, I really want to move to Portland and I really want to try to do music full time. He was ready to just go for it. And I had to think about that for a while and I ended up taking a year's leave of absence because I wasn't, I am probably to this day and definitely then less of a risk taker than Marv was. Uh And I wasn't sure that this was going to work. And so he just quit his job. He always knew that he was done teaching and that he was going to do music full time. And he was right. We never went back. I did not take them up on that coming back to that job a year later. But you had your backup plan. I had a backup plan. That's right. Yes. I'm a little more like yeah. you. I I can take a leave, yeah. but I really want that safety net like kind of underneath there somewhere. Yes. <laughs> and the leap maybe to be not too yep. far. So tell me about Seafood Mama and Harden My Heart. What What's the story around that song? Seafood Mama was a band of, there were five of us. And the, one of the interesting things about the instrumentation, we had bass and drums and guitar, and me picking up the saxophone, which I had played briefly in the fifth grade and put down because I was the only girl saxophone player in my fifth Mm -hmm. grade class. And I was quite intimidated by that at the time. But I still had my father's saxophone and decided to see what I remembered about playing. And I just started, in fact, I was playing on stage well before I should have been, but just started you know, playing by ear various solos and stuff that I heard with, uh, especially with Marv's original tunes. The other unique thing about Seafood Mama is that one of the members, his main thing that he did was play violin. So we had bass, drums, guitar, saxophone, and violin. And um, we had kind of a unique sound at times with the sax and violin Um, the alto sax and violin uh, kind of doing harmony lines together and stuff, which was great fun. And very unique. It was unique and just had a very fun time, played for about three years, finally working our way into downtown Portland. We kind of played the suburbs until we kind of got well-known enough and had enough of a following to play at the more coveted clubs and developed a following. So what year was this about and and how often were you playing during that time? We were playing probably at least three nights a week and sometimes more than that. And this was four hours a night, right? Yeah, they were long. Nobody opened in those days for you. You just That's exactly right. It was generally nine to one and sometimes nine to two. I think that was probably 77 through uh, 1980. Oh, wow. In 1980, Marv had this song. He took the title from a poem that a friend of ours had written. He wrote this song and it was a really, was one of those things that happened really quick. And um, we recorded it in our basement with this reel-to-reel that we had financed from getting a little loan from Marv's dad. (laughs) Amazing. Yeah. Because not very many people had recording gear at that time. That's that's right. And it, it was interesting that the saxophone riff was kind of, Marv kind of he said, well, I want you playing saxophone something in the beginning. And, and he kind of came up with a couple notes and had me just fool around with it. And I turned it into that line that turned into kind of this iconic thing that yes. that has been very good to us. So that song was huge and it enabled you to do so many things. You were then signed to Geffen Records. And how long did your recording career with Quarter Flash and Geffen? And well, last? and I should back up just a little bit in that the first recording of Hard My Heart was with Seafood Mama. And, uh, and 
45 oh, that we right. put out locally and distributed ourselves. We would go to the various stores <laughs> with our 45s and kind of like coal miner's daughter, right? It was sort of like that. And it was on the basis of that, that an A&R person came from the Geffen label, which was a new label. Uh, they had um, signed only some kind of big heavyweights, including John Lennon and Elton John and uh, Donna Summer. Wow. Her name was Carol Child, and she came to hear us play when we were playing in Seattle. And she was really interested. And at this point, we had a manager of this person that had gone to LA and shopped that 45 and mostly got doors closed on him. But the fact that he took the 45 to David Geffen's office was how she came to hear us in Seattle. And she offered us a deal with Geffen and a producer named John Boylan was asked to come to Seattle and record a few songs that we would likely do on the record to see how the band did. And he said that he uh, really liked the band, but he wasn't sure that we worked well as far as the instrumentation he was concerned about whether or not that would work and decided that the deal would just be for Marv and I, which was really difficult. We'd been a band. Yeah, and when you're a band, it's like you're, you've are you done all these, you've played together three years and basically live together. It's like your family at that point. Yeah. So it was a really hard thing. But did you feel, you must have felt like he was, he was right in terms of where you saw the band going eventually? or Where he was right, and we knew this, that some of the players were much more in the direction of country. And uh -huh. that's not the direction that Marv wanted to go. And and Harden My Heart and some of the the songs that he had started writing were really different than the Seafood Mama, All Over the Map, Swing and Country. And because and you were a bar band. I mean, when you're a bar band and you play four hours a night, you got to play a lot of material, <laughs> you know, and it's hard to play originals for four hours. Nobody's going to yeah. stick around and party to that. So creatively, it's a different it animal, is. I think. It is. So it makes sense that when you got this feedback, Marv was already thinking, yeah. or, you know, this is where I want to go with my songwriting. And so yeah. the switch And so made sense. the first album was primarily done with studio musicians, with the exception of uh, Bruce Sweetman, who played uh, the violin on some of the debut album, like Find Another Fool. There's a violin part in that. And so it was a hard time, but it was also just an extremely exhilarating time. Well, the three years that you were playing around Portland, and then the two or three years before that, you'd already been doing gigs for six years. Is that right? Yes, pretty much. Jones Road and then Seafood Mama. It was definitely about six years of playing a lot. And really honing your craft and getting some stage right. craft together and all of those kinds of things. I mean, because you're just, you're green when you start out. And that's the wonderful thing about that time period is that when you got a little bit of success locally, you could play a lot. And all that experience is hard to get, I think, these days because there's so many bands and you can only play, you know, like a four band bill or a, even a two band bill. You're only playing an hour and a half to right. two hours, maybe, you know, yeah. so four hours a night, three to five nights a week is a is a good uh, learning experience for sure. And those early bands, we traded vocalists. I was not the only uh, vocalist. Uh, right, because no way can you last for four hours. Right, when you're, right. You know, and, like, and it was fun because they were more country kind of singers and stuff. And so, uh -huh. yeah, but then it all, it really changed when we began to really focus in on a new band that we decided to call Quarter Flash and have it be definitely a kind of an AOR rock kind of niche instead of bar band all over the map. <laughs> what did success look like to you before you got the record deal? And then how was it different than you expected? 
I think before we got the record deal, success was measured in can we make a living? Can we put food on the table and a roof over our heads and and not be too stretched all the time? And so actually with Seafood Mama, we felt, you know, really quite successful because we were even able to save a little bit of money and buy a starter house because we were working enough, which for most musicians, that's really a, quite amazing. You know, it is uh, amazing. Yeah. It's a miracle. Actually. It's a miracle. <laughs> it's a miracle. So, um, and Portland was a different place to buy real estate in at that time too. Yes. So you got in at oh, a good yeah. moment. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It was very different. And so actually getting signed was, um, was both exciting for me uh, and and definitely for Marv, but also even a little bit frightening because the expectations and what success looks like is different. So for us, we didn't really focus on that piece because it was compared to what? Um, it was like, woo woo, you know, we get to record with this amazing producer who's, you know, worked with the Eagles and Little River Band and Linda Ronstadt. And, and it's just like, it's all great. And whether or not anything happened, we just felt so energized and blessed that we had this opportunity. And so the fact that the record, took off and did so well, I think was kind of shocking to us. I mean, in an awesome way, right? but it seemed to happen really fast. And all of a sudden we were asked to go out on these big tours and we had not ever played in these big venues before. And so it was a real it's such a different animal. It's a real learning experience. Yeah. Sure. I remember thinking uh, when we were playing three to five nights a week and four hours a night, you know, oh man, if I can do this, I can do tours. Mm -hmm. That sounds cushy, you know, because the only pictures I had ever seen were of Dolly Parton's tour bus where she's got the gold sink and the chandeliers and stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and she's probably got at least a day in between. Well, maybe she didn't, but a day in between uh, cities so that she had a little bit of rest time or whatever. But it's a different kind of pressure. How did you navigate that pressure? Mm. Um, you know, I think that the piece of that that was invaluable for Marv and I was that we were doing it together. And mm -hmm our bandmates that we had put together this band from another Portland band and assembled a group that could tour on the new record, they were not with their partners. And so I think it was really harder for the rest of the band than it was for Marv and I, as far as that, having someone at the end of the night that you could process with not that we didn't do that as a band because we did, but it's different. I get what you're saying. Yeah, totally. like, like if you if you felt like you sucked that night or something, that someone who could just pat you on the back and say, you know, it's really okay. And it's also an amazing thing. Like you guys were on Dick Clark's American Bandstand show, and those kind of experiences too are incredible to be able to share with your partner. I mean, yes. at the end of the day, you can look at each other and go. Oh my God, <laughs> what just yeah. happened here? I know. <laughs> you know, and that that's pretty a wonderful thing too. And I do agree with you. Our band had a lot harder time than I think John and I did. This was the days before you could call your significant other up on your phone and see each other. You know, yes. you had to use a pay phone. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> on the road oh my God. you know and it was long distance and it was really yeah. yeah it was very very challenging we were older we were 30 when we were signed we were not 21 mm. so and I think just having that little bit of extra life experience that we were not too dazzled I mean in a, in a bad way like right too full of ourselves mm -hmm. <laughs> You'd seen a few things go on already that gave you some, um, and, and a little idea of how life works. Yeah. This is such a different world that we live in now. 
Record companies still exist, but they're more like a team for artists and they're not the gatekeepers anymore. Whereas when we were both signed to labels, that was the only, pretty much the only way you could get heard on radio. I'm kind of wondering how, how the relationships that you had with the record company and your manager and, and those kinds of things went. Like, for instance, producers. I never really knew what a producer's job was until we started making records. And even these days, you can work with producers and kind of go, well, what is their job? What do they do? Our first producer was really a teacher. I mean, John Boylan is still a dear friend, um, and we saw him fairly recently. He's an amazing man and loved the role that he took with us, which he knew that we were absolute rubes, and he would educate along the way in the most benevolent, non-pejorative sort of way. That's so lucky. It was so lucky. In fact, he put us up at his house during the uh, recording of the debut album. That's right. And that's where you found a book with the name Quarter Flash in it. Is that right? Yeah, at his house. At his house, he had just produced the Little River Band, um, an Australian band, and he had this book of Australian folk sayings. And we came across this phrase, quarter flash, which meant that some one was one quarter flash and three parts foolish. And that just seemed to (laughs) epitomize who we were and just our whole attitude about what we were doing is just like, well, let's just throw it against the wall and see see if we can, yeah, and see if we can (laughs) laugh along the way. And that's awesome. um, Yeah. So he was great. And we used John for the Uh, that album and then another album. And our third album, which was Back Into Blue, Marv kind of wanted to have a little bit more of a keyboard-oriented recording, someone that was a little bit more into um, not really dance music, but different, not quite just a, a solid rock type format. And so we chose Steve Levine, who was a, a still lives in London, I believe, and was the, the producer for Culture Club. So right. Very different. Okay. So we're heading into the mid 80s where all of a sudden there's all this new technology. Yeah. And it's exciting, I think, to those of us who hadn't heard it before. Well, what happened was that Steve wanted to make the record in Miraval, which is a recording studio in the south of France. And it was later, just recently, owned by Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. Oh, my goodness. It was their... Kind of a nice spread then, I bet. Yeah, it's an amazing (laughs) spread. Yes. And so it was an amazing experience to record a record so far away from home and have this experience of this techno world. But what we hadn't uh, really planned on is, and we did not know Steve very well, is that Steve wanted to basically sequence everything. Oh, and that's and not even the guitar. That's not you. Yeah, that's not you guys at all. And it's not us. And so there was some push pull on that record. And I know that for me, the additional push pull was that I felt that the only way I could really have my voice heard as far as production ideas was to deliver it through Marv because mm. Steve wouldn't take direction from me. It was like it was immediately dismissed, but then Marv could say the same thing. Oh, that's so frustrating. And he'd go, okay, yeah, we could do that. Oh, my God, Rindy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. It uh, It left a, a – I learned from it. I learned from it. What did you learn and what would you do differently now, if anything? Um, I would have called him on it more. Mm -hmm. But I felt like at the time we were so far away from home, I didn't want to impede the process. It's expensive for one thing. Yes. Yes. And I decided that if I could get heard 
by hook or by crook <laughs> that I, as long as it happened that I kind of got some of my ideas in place that I would let it go. Um, yeah. It felt um, pretty awful, I would think. Yeah, it felt bad at times. Yeah. Wow. So how many more records did you make for Geffen after that? Did you work with any other producers? No. At that point, after Back Into Blue, which was enough of a departure for us that I think our hardcore fans went, what? Mm -hmm. You know, I still like the record, but it is really different than mm -hmm. um, than the debut album or Take Another Picture, which was the second album. And our A and R person, Carol Childs, um, left Geffen. And the record company world is really driven by your relationship with your A and R person. And if you lose that connection, then you can get just put on someone else's plate and. We were put on the plate of John Kalodner, who is a heavy metal guy. Oh, yeah. That happened to us, too. <laughs> yes, I know well, it did. Yeah, it, which is so weird that, yeah. you know, I mean, we started out as a dance band, and then all of a sudden, I think it was the a &R guy for White Lion. But you know what we should go back and talk about a little bit? Sure. Is what an A&R person does. Because okay. I don't think, I mean, I didn't even really know. Oh, I didn't either. You know, when we were a bar band and people would say, oh, yeah, the record company is going to send out an A&R person. I had no idea what they did and how important that relationship was. We ended right. up having, I think, three or four different A&R people because mm -hmm. they just didn't last very long in the record company environment usually. Mm -hmm. And, oh, my God, it was so hard because they needed to go to bat for you. But if they stuck out their neck too far for the artist... Then they were accused of not working for the label. So they were usually fired, is what right. we discovered. So anyway, talk about your relationship with your A&R person and how important that was in that environment. Absolutely. And and a and R stands for Artists and Repertoire. The role that she played with us, Carol Childs, was that she was our point person with the label and she would run interference with the president of the label and with David Geffen himself, go to bat for us, as you said. And her opinion had weight with us as far as the direction of the songwriting. And so she was a fan of Marv's songwriting and was not an impediment to him much at all, which was great. Uh, so we liked working with Carol. She was an interesting, very interesting woman. And she helped get us the soundtrack work with uh, Ron Howard film, Night Shift. Oh, yeah. And was close friends with Carol Bayer Sager, who was married to. Oh, my um, goodness. Yeah, I know. Who was married to Burt Bacharach. Marv ended up writing a song with him. Is that right? Yes. He, they had written the song Night Shift, which was the opening song for the movie, and wanted us to perform it. And we went over to Bert and Carol's house and they... What an experience just I, doing oh, that. I know. And Marv is such, and I too, such a Burt Bacharach fan. Oh, me too. That period of songwriting. Oh, all the absolutely. Way. But w what was interesting about it was that at the time they were totally into pac-man games oh funny and mr and ms pac-man you know and they would play pac-man and so the lyric for night shift which is about basically having a brothel in a morgue oh great yeah, it's a comedy <laughs> yes <laughs> running a brothel in a morgue <laughs> but carol bayer sager's lyrics were about inky and blinky of pac-man Oh, and wild. and so Marv was in this horrible conundrum of what do I do? I'm a lyric guy and I can't <laughs> we can't do this if these are the lyrics. And so he, Oh, th that is a really hard place to be. Oh my gosh, because we wanted the gig so much, but um And here he, are these two people who are like, yeah. you know, the, the mountaintop. Yes. <laughs> of songwriting so he ends up asking Bert Bacharach if he could tweak the lyric on the verses some and Bert said sure and wow. 
Marv did and submitted them. And evidently Carol Bayer was so angry. And our person, Carol Childs, went to bat for Marv, but she had this thing with her close friend, oh, you know, wild. over Marv getting his way on the lyric. So it ended up being a co-write. Yeah. Amazing. I know. I know. Anyway, um, so Carol was wonderful. Uh, later on, the A&R person that we worked with briefly at Epic Records was also great, Don Grierson, but he got fired right as our record was coming out, a record called Girl in the Wind. And because he got fired, all of his projects were shelved. And so this thing that we had worked on for two years was just all of a sudden put on a shelf and they wouldn't allow us to buy it. So we were done. So that's how it all ended. Well, that is how it ended. And we decided that we did not want to seek another label. We came home to Portland. It felt like our writing and our creativity was not our own. And uh, it, we had no control over it after that experience. We decided that we were going to come back and self-produce and kind of lick our wounds and decide what comes next. Mm -hmm. so that's what we did. Yeah. And wow. that's how the trail band got started. Um, just a, a real huge left turn. So two things happened after your record deal ended. You and Marv switched gears creatively completely and formed mm -hmm. the trail band. And then I think you also went back to school and got your master's in psychology and started working in the field of counseling. Is that right? Yes. My master's was in counseling. And that very much had to do with that feeling of wanting to be in control of my own life mm -hmm. and my work life, but also that feeling again of wanting to be an educator, a helper which had really driven me in the first place. In terms of relationships, that's such a different kind of experience than anything that you would find in the music yeah. business. Very, very different, but I loved it and I did it for 15 years. I didn't realize it was for that long. Yeah. yeah. That's incredible. Now, some people would probably wonder, why did she go back to work at all? They had this platinum record. They had all the success. Why go back? and do a day job, even if you feel called to do it? Well, um, two things. I think that, um, and most people that have good fortune as far as making enough money that they are getting, you know, some songwriter royalties or whatever ongoing, they don't just stop working be or finding things that have meaning for them uh, mm -hmm. because you know, you can only ride around on a sailboat and eat bonbons and drink champagne <laughs> yeah, for so long until you go, is this making me happy? And right, right. And you have a penchant for wanting to be useful too. Yes, so, I do. Yeah. Right. So there was that. But also one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that when you make a record with a record company, they pay for everything and then you have to recoup the costs that they incur with your recordings before you ever make any money on the sales of the records. Mm -hmm. And so people think, well, you're just making a whole lot of money. And fortunately, as a songwriter, Marv was able to get songwriters royalties, but we were not getting royalties from the sales of the record because we had spent a lot like on the, the France uh, situation, mm -hmm. et cetera. So those were expensive records. And so we needed right. to work. Yeah. 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 That is something that I think um, people don't realize about record companies and why even today, though record companies can be important and they can be a good partner in your music. And I think there's some record companies that are on the smaller side that artists can have more of a, uh, of a say in their own creativity. But yeah, they have costs and the artist is the one that gets to pay them. I remember having a dream back when we were on tour in 1986 that I came home from the tour and I got a check for a dollar. <laughs> Because we lost money on the tour, you know? I mean, and here, you, 
and we weren't making uh, any money yet on the songwriting piece. <laughs> and thank God, um, you know, that Marv, uh, your husband Marv and my husband John um, wrote these songs and yes. kept the publishing, uh, the songwriters part anyway. And yeah. so, um, yeah, because the, the performers now through a thing called Sound Exchange can make some money but that's performance royalties and that's not radio and that's not songwriting royalties so they're they're all different publishing is an interesting thing and if you I are know. lucky enough to to have a song that does well being the songwriter on that song is golden yes. it's a really wonderful wonderful thing yes your record deal ended you and marv switched gears and you went back to school we just talked about that piece and then you also started a band called the Trail Band. So what was that time period like for you? The genesis of the Trail Band was that Marv was asked to write a play, uh, a musical, about the Oregon Trail experience because Oregon was going to be celebrating the sesquicentennial of the Oregon Trail, which... I didn't even know what that meant, but it's 150 years. I'm impressed um, that you can even say that word. I know. I had to <laughs> slow down. Yeah. And so he got excited about that because it was so different from what we had been doing. And he did write this musical and put together a band to to be part of the musical. There were actors and an eight-piece band that was strings and brass and just very kind of of the era type sounding uh, of the 1840s through 1860 or so, influenced by Stephen Foster. And so it was kind of one of those things that we did the musical and toured around Oregon with, you know, these crazy actors and this crazy band. And it was really, really fun. And the actors, you know, went on to the next project. And we had had such a good time with the band that we decided, well, let's kind of stay together. And we have to call ourselves something. Let's, well, the trail band, which is really, to this day, such a hokey name, but it stuck. It's such a great blend of different things. And the musicians in that band are really wonderful. Amazing musicians. Amazing musicians. Um, and you recorded a total of 13 albums. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. And really about half of those turned into holiday albums because that kind of became a wonderful niche uh, that the band played these shows in December every year where we would combine kind of old timey Christmas stuff with um, originals and some jazz. And because the musicians are so amazing that in some ways it was like the Seafood Mama experience where it was a bit all over the map, mm. but it seemed to delight the audience. So mm -hmm. we felt very blessed to have that experience. You had some great special guests on your yes. on your Christmas shows. Including and, you and your you mom. Know, that was so sweet. That was so sweet. Yeah, Mal Malcolm had just been born, I think, the year before, and it was my first show, or second maybe, since he had been born, and I just remember being so freaked out <laughs> because yeah. I was like, I don't know. It just had been a while. It's funny how even if you played a million gigs, if you take some time off. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, true. It's, hard to get, it's hard to get that muscle going again. So, But I had a great time. I had a great time on your show. It was great having you. So working with Marv, uh, people ask me all the time, and it's not my favorite question, you know, what's it like to work with your husband? Um, but I think of it a little bit differently because you guys have been together for how many years now? 400. <laughs> um, no, but, but nearly. <laughs> uh, we are at, let's see, we are at 48. Whoa. We are 48th anniversary this of, of knowing year. each other or of being married being married oh my goodness so you knew yeah. each other we were babies you, you've known each other longer than 48 years because we we just celebrated our 44th anniversary but it's the 44th anniversary of us knowing each other that's when we met and then we lived in sin for seven years and then we got married so yeah. you're saying 
48 years of so marriage. 52, 52 years altogether. Holy mackerel. I know That's we met in high school. Mm -hmm. What does your relationship as collaborators look like? And how has that relationship changed over the years? You know, I think why it has endured our marriage as well as our collaborative work is because we have different strengths and we kind of don't tread too much on the other person's territory. Mm -hmm. um, he is the songwriter. I am more of an editor for him. He tends to write 20 verses to get three mm -hmm. and, and I will help him hone it down. Uh, so he listens to me there, but I don't mess too much with his, his songwriting and he allows me to interpret pretty much the way I want to. And so uh, the singing part, and he's not a singer. He has a sung and does sing on stage because I love it when he does, but he's not a confident singer, but sometimes he's the best person to sing his songs. Mm -hmm. And so I have been his voice and he has been my writer. That's really cool. It sounds like yeah. a great division of labor. And neither one of you aspires to take over the other person's job. It's been a really wonderful marriage in terms of the music. I have to say, one of my favorite records that you guys have made is called Goodbye Uncle Buzz. Mm -hmm. And I just love it. The chords are interesting. And again, the stories are front and center and so well told. I read that uh, when you were recording this record, and this is, I don't know, back in the... 2000s, I think you released mm -hmm. that record. Yes. That you approached it differently in the studio than you ever had before and recorded your voice and guitar first mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. put everything else around it. We did. We had a click so that we wouldn't drive ourselves crazy as far as lining things up tempo wise. But you're right. We did just the voice and Marv's guitar. So very bare bones and then slowly adding things, um, sometimes then subtracting them because sometimes bare bones is better. Mm hmm. Yeah, sometimes less is more. And it was a really fun experience. And I did a, a lot of the harmony washes myself, just layering various intervals on top of what came before. And so I, then I was getting my yayas from all the harmony stuff. And it was very fun. Yeah, you know, which is also is like a full circle kind of thing when you get to sing yeah. with yourself and create those harmonies. And it's just... I don't know, shimmers. I, I like all the songs on that record. It spent a, a lot of time in rotation in my car. One of the songs that I really especially love the lyrics for is a song called Crazy Quilt. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to read a little bit of it, if you don't mind. I've been walking in the mornings with my worried friend, and she's been working on this crazy quilt for months on end. And she's fighting with the colors and the stitches and the batting and the backing and the chemo in her hands. And she's piecing it together the best that she can. And these quilts that she's made, they cover all her walls. She's run out of places to put them and she says, what do I do? What do I do with them all? about how you approached telling this story. Marv has this ability to uh, make me cry a lot with his lyrics. Oh, good. Um, so I'm not the only one. <laughs> oh, no. No. And when he brought this song, uh, these lyrics to me, I 
uh, it took a while for me to be able to sing it without crying because I am a cancer survivor. And one of the things that got me through my experience was my neighbors walking with me after as much as I could. It was shortened distances when I was on chemo, but walking the neighborhood, uh, just trying to be outside, trying to get through this. And then one of my co-workers, I mean, excuse me, one of my co-walkers also got breast oh, cancer. Wow. And, and then it was her turn and we were supporting her up and down those hills. And he took the metaphor of the crazy quilt and I thought it just fit so well, but it took me a while <laughs> to be able to just, okay, I'm going to sing this song. I'm going to deliver <laughs> these lyrics. And instead of every time singing it, I had to take in exactly what it was about. I had to get past yeah. that uh, in order to perform it's it. It's almost like you have to divorce yourself from the song sometimes yeah. in yeah. order to be able to be the storyteller. It's a yes. tough balance, isn't it? Like being open, like having it your is. heart crack open enough to to have all of that that's in there be a part of it, but not overwhelm you. It's, it's You did a great job, right. I think. I just am reading it. I'm not even singing it and I'm bawling, you know. Um, anyway, yeah, well done. And I'm so glad that you survived. And so in terms of songs that he's written and how you've interpreted them, do you approach original songs versus cover songs differently? And has your process changed at all over the years? With the exception of some songs that we've done at Christmas that are traditional Christmas songs, I don't do cover mm -hmm. songs, which is really interesting. I am totally lame at knowing cover songs. Even classic songs, I have to have a fake book in front of me to know the lyrics because I haven't sung cover songs in so many That's years. Really since Wow. Supernova. Yeah. We just don't do any. We do. We sometimes would do a Dylan song like in Quarter Flash just as an mm -hmm. encore, as this tribute to him. But mostly it's just all That is songs. very different. And so you're not using a model of any kind because your voice, I mean, besides no. maybe Marv doing a demo for you, your voice is the first one that's interpreting this song. So you don't have all these other voices in your head as you're trying to create your own version. You know, I really haven't thought much about that, but you're absolutely right. And in some ways it is because I'm the first one, it is, uh, it frees you up a lot because you're right. You often compare yourself to the iconic version of that song, whether it's a classic or a rock mm -hmm. classic. So yeah. Do you, do yeah, you have a way sure. in to learning these songs? How does your relationship with them go? I know every song's different, so that might be a hard question, but. Well, um, I think the direction that Marv gives me is part of how I start out because he allows me to mess with the melody a little bit too. He's not real attached to his every note being as he originally thought of it. If I can come up with something that he thinks sells the song better, he says, yeah, go cool. do that. Uh, so that's great. But also, I think there are times when he wants it to be more narrating the story without it being emotional, mm. which is not the way I would approach it. I would maybe want it to be more theatrical. But for him, there have been a few times when he said, no, I just want the lyric to move people, not you over amping mm -hmm. it. Uh, I want it to sell it. And he's been right that sometimes just understated can be a powerful mm -hmm. thing. So that usually that kind of direction actually gives you. Um, yeah. Focus. Yeah. It gives me a Cont window a container. Uh, yeah. yeah. It sounds like his direction is kind enough that it lands pretty well with you. Yeah. I mean, he's had a lot of time to know uh, 
what sets me <laughs> off and 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 how I take in information. And so he's gotten really that's good really at cool. it. And that's actually, I mean, for anybody out there listening, that is also a producer's job with a singer, you yes. know, to let yes. them do the thing that they do best, but also sometimes provide a structure that supports them and, and the song in a way that's better. But how yeah. producers give direction, I mean, or how you get that feedback. It, 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 I know for me, it can make or break the experience that I have. But sometimes I've had some lousy experiences recording and the, the actual record turned out great. So <laughs> I don't know how you feel mm -hmm. in the moment matters. But sometimes what gets on the actual recording, you don't hear that. Yeah, transcends yeah. it. Yes, yes, that's it's, very true. I've had yeah, this same experience. Interesting. If you could go back in time and talk to a younger version of yourself, what would you say to her? I would say that you need to stop worrying so much and that I need to trust myself more and that every decision is not monumental, that the sun will come up even if I screw up because I tend to be pretty hard on myself. And as I've gotten older, I've definitely gotten better about saying no when no is what I mean, or sometimes saying yes when I've been afraid mm. to say yes. So I think that goes along with maybe telling myself it's good to take risks and try things that I think um, might be out of my wheelhouse, you know, because I have had good experiences of trying something and, oh, I guess, it, you know, it's mm -hmm. okay. And that was even mm -hmm. fun. So, and I think the other thing I would tell myself, and this is also something that I think comes with age is that it's really great to surround yourself really as much as possible with people that like to laugh. Surrounding yourself with people that are positive is so important that there have been times I think when I have held on to relationships where that maybe were a little bit one-sided or where I just kept trying to muddle through darkness. And I have learned that, you know, maybe it's really okay to just say, well, time to move on. And I need to surround myself with light and uh, laughter. And that's certainly what I am trying to do in my older years. That's sure. lovely. And this is uh, this is obviously a a, a lifelong <laughs> uh, endeavor. Absolutely. But yeah, it's not something you learn once and go, oh, good, and I'm done with that. No, it's like something that you have to keep reminding over yourself that and over, over and over. Stop worrying. Let it go. Go hang out with and laugh. Yes, you know. It always. There's helps. a great song on Uncle Buzz called "Rise Above." And I love the chorus. Can I read it? Sure. Love isn't having the things that we want. It's wanting the things we have. Life is deciding whether we cry or laugh. Oh, remember you're a part of the moon and the stars, a part of those you love. Oh, hold on to these things. They're your wings to rise above. And she said love isn't having the things that we want. It's wanting the things we have. One last question. You're in a huge transitional time. You guys have just, uh, you and Marv have just put Quarter Flash to bed and the trail band. You've stopped, you did your last Christmas shows really recently. You've been doing that for more than 30 years. What's next? Well, what is next is that Marv has found a, 
a friend that is a great male voice for him, which is really exciting. It's actually really exciting for both of us because there are some songs of Marv's that he sings, but he's never been comfortable as a singer. So that I couldn't deliver them. They're really, they're a Mm -hmm. guy song. And so John Koontz is is working with Marv as far as doing some songs that are in that category. And then he and I have another project that is just the two of us that we are about halfway finished with of a bunch of new songs of his that just absolutely knock me out. I'm so proud of him. And so that is what we're working on. And he and I are just going to do a bunch of duo type performances, small venue, house concerts. It not about money, but just about, um, it's about the music and conveying these new songs. So we're pretty excited about it. It's like a, a new a chapter. new adventure together. I'm so glad that he's still writing songs and that you're still interpreting them and that we get to hear more from both of you. It's a lovely thing. So thank you again for being here today. We uh, we made it even through the snow and <laughs> all kinds of stuff. But it's been lovely having you. I've enjoyed doing this. That's it for this episode of Living a Vocal Life. You'll find complete show notes for each episode, videos of my guests, and more offerings for singers at ValerieDaySings.com. I'd also love to hear from you, so please let me know what you found useful in this conversation and what you'd like to hear more of in episodes to come right there on my website. If you like what you've heard, consider sharing with a friend. You can also subscribe on iTunes or wherever you go for podcasts. Better yet, leave a review. This podcast is new, so the more reviews, the easier it will be for others to find it. Until next time, be well, keep singing, and thanks for listening.